Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. SUPEX, the Startup Expo, North America's premier startup conference, is March 6th and 7th, 2017, in sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Affordably priced, SUPEX is a two-day international conference featuring workshops, panels, speeches, a $50,000 startup competition, and over 100 exhibitors. For more information, go to sup-x.org. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Alan Alden. He's the founder and managing director at Series A Partners. Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, I mean, for, thanks for your time. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing with Series A is, is really interesting to me and kind of a different take on kind of the traditional investment firm in Silicon Valley. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. I grew up in uh, the mean streets of Kansas, the Silicon Prairie in Kansas City. Sure. And uh, went to undergrad in law school at the University of Kansas. Okay. What made you take law, just out of curiosity? Yeah, that's a good question. I was looking at it, kind of the business route or the legal route. I just figured that uh, I had a you know, pretty decent business background, education growing up. And I figured that that would just give me a very holistic you know, approach of analyzing companies and, you know, uh, in the business world. It just would provide something to differentiate me. And I think it just from the thought process, that's always very important to have uh, to understand the legal components and the ramifications of legal issues when you are working in the business world. Sure. No, I, I think it's really good. It's kind of like if you have like a law degree or like an accounting degree, it can help so much in business. Yeah, so I, absolutely. I, I, I totally get that. So, you know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the accounting part because uh, I was just at the gym recently and a question was brought to me about accounting or another class. And I just told that person, I said, whatever you do, take accounting. It's one of the most important classes you can have and skills to have in life moving forward. Sure. So you have quite the impressive career. You, were, you did some investment banking and kind of worked in the financial side. But I'm kind of curious to maybe know why you kind of decided to found series a and what was the rationale behind it yeah you know i i always love being around entrepreneurs and you know growing the startup phase in those early the early days you know there's a lot of excitement um i think it's a very challenging time um being an entrepreneur I, people don't really realize how difficult it is it's an emotional roller yep. you know you always have i call it the trough of disenchantment you know you get your 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 excitement and you know a friend of mine was a TechCrunch disrupt. He's one of the finalists there. You know they had a big wave going forward, and then I remember having that conversation around you know a year later, where going through that tough period, and you just see how difficult it is. And you know I think where you can provide that support, and I think it's being able to be around really interesting people every day with great ideas. I, there's just not a better job in the world. I mean, it's, um, I love the dynamic nature of technology to begin with and just how it's always constantly changing. But couple that with being around that entrepreneurial spirit and it's really a glass, you know, half full attitude sure. that you have to have as an entrepreneur. And you know, it's where, for me, it's a learning experience. And at the same time, if I can provide any advice and help and, and help these people, you know, uh, achieve their dreams you know, more power to it. And you know, that's, that's really what I, what I wanted to do. And I was doing banking before and banking provided, a, you know, it's a good foundation, but if I'm going to spend 110 hours a week in an office, I'm going to do it on my own, own accord. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. So what, what kind of services do you guys kind of offer in series A partners? Yeah, so what we're doing is um, we're advising family offices overseas and providing them, uh, family offices and other investment groups, providing them uh, Silicon Valley-based presence. And you know, that's one part of it. And with that being said, is there's a lot of companies out there who are wanting to make investments and, you know, again, better understand the landscape. I think one of the biggest problems you have is you have a lot of companies coming overseas and, you know, you're seeing a big 
uh, rising corporate venture capital and other types of investment, and they all want a piece of the, the Valley action. They come over here, they think that they spend, you know, two, three days visiting Facebook, they visit Google, stop by the Uber office. I call it the Silicon Valley petting zoo, where they just, you know, they, they quickly come through, they'll hit, you know, a couple of accelerators, stop by WeWork, Rocket Space, you know, different places, and talk about innovation for a couple hours. But you need to have somebody on the ground here, really, who understands the landscape and has a good understanding and has a network capable of getting in front of the right deals and the right deal flow. Sure. So, and, you know, I've been out here since 1998, came in, you know, the early days. And it, it really, I think it's important. Um, you know, one of the reasons we study history is trends repeat themselves. And that is, you know, very true when you go through the manias and the different time periods. And it gives you a better idea of, you know, when do you go long and, you know, when do you pull back and ahead of that curve? You know, it's kind of the, the, the big short scenario. Um, I think it just gives you a better perspective on when not to get too excited about things and just give you a little bit more of a level head. But anyway, so w one part is that advisory. The second part is then kind of going back to the traditional banking side and looking at liquidity events and helping companies with uh, capital raises as well as uh, exit opportunities or corporate restructuring. Okay. And that's another part of the business and, you know, always trying to help uh, if, you know, those are big life events for founders and uh, trying try to provide that, those um, services as well. No, that's great. That's, that's really interesting. I, I've never really had anybody on the show or really kind of met anybody that kind of does exactly what, you guys do right and i i think it's it's fascinating because i think even just being me living and being born and raised in north america you you don't really think about outside of north america right and like how it's the same or different and it's like it's just a different aspect to think about right that we're we're kind of in our own little bubble and i totally get that a lot of people outside of that maybe that with money to invest kind of want to capitalize on that and they don't understand that it, you kind of need to understand how things work because I think how things work in the Valley aren't necessarily how things work in other parts of America or North America. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you bring up a good point is, you know, I think the one thing about the Silicon Valley, which is just very unique, um, is it's really, is it's DNA and it's the, the fear of, you know, there's, Everywhere else in the world, there's such a huge fear of failure. And in the Valley, people don't fear it as much. I don't want to say it's a badge of honor in any way, because it, it shouldn't be. But with that being said, the risk level is so much higher than anywhere else in the world. I spend a lot of time in, uh, in the Middle East as well. South Africa is another country where I spend a fair amount of time. And um, usually they're, I'm actually hidden there on Friday. Um, but just seeing that, the, you know, the tolerance for risk is in in the valley it's just it's like nowhere else sure. and in some ways it's very refreshing and i'll tell you it's very frustrating when you're used to being around that level of risk and then trying to be around uh you know and you have to put yourself in check every now and then when you're talking to other investors in other parts of the world sure. and it, it is definitely a different mindset so but uh, yeah go on what what is their big struggle it's they don't they want to limit their risk as much as possible or, or what are their kind of struggles with potentially investing in us based startups? Well, I think you look at the typical model, uh, the VC model, um, you know, if you invest in 10 companies, you, you, one will be a home run if you're lucky. Sure. And then two will be, you know, decent, uh, you know, double triples, but, and then the other ones you'll see where they fall, but it's a much, you know, you're, you're betting on, yeah, you're putting 10 horses out there, but, you know, realistically, those numbers dwindle very quickly. And whereas if you're a typical investor, um, you know, coming from other industries, you're looking for the singles and doubles all day. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's a great investment strategy, depending on what you're doing. And it's just, you know, it's that a, it's all about assumption of risk and understanding it. And with risk comes return. 
Sure. And so it, it's just definitely different. And, you know, you look at the Middle East where, you know, they have you know traditionally invested a lot in natural resources, be it, you know, energy, oil, things like that, as well as uh, building, you know, and Dubai is a, a place where, you know, is one of the guys that a uh, gentleman at Dubai Holding mentioned, he's like, we're very good at building boxes and selling boxes, mm-hmm. you know, being sense of selling apartments and, and buildings. And the, you know, their understanding of technology and technology risk, it's, it's harder for them to get their arms around. Sure. And so, and it's just getting people very comfortable with that. Okay. So do you, do you find that like they have trouble kind of innovating or, or they struggle to do kind of different innovative things in other parts of the world or? No, not at all. No. And, and okay. And I, I think it's it's very interesting when you look, and I think that's the problem with the bubble of, of the Silicon Valley is you don't appreciate some of the innovation that is going on in other parts uh, of the world. Ah, okay. You know, I think it look at mobile payments. Mobile payments have really had different, I mean, mobile wallets especially, sure. have really had a, a huge problem in getting traction yeah. in, in the States. I mean, Google has spent a fortune on trying to get it in the Android and get people to get that uptake. Yep. And you look at a platform like M-Pesa in Kenya, 70% of the GDP of Kenya is going through a mobile payments platform. Wow. A lot of that is SMS-based payments. I mean, we're talking old school phones, leveraging those to make payments. Right. Interesting. And it, you just have to understand the, and with that being said, on the other side of the continent, Nigeria, you have basically 0.1% of the GDP going through mobile payments because there's such a distrust of, you know, there's endemic corruption and distrust okay. of the system where you could be on the same continent, but it's a world apart. Right. Interesting. And going back to innovation, I think one of the best entrepreneurs in the world is Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai. Okay. I mean, take, taking a country in the early 1990s, well, his father, you know, they realized that they were very low on natural resources and they were going to be gone and within 20 years. And they, you know, figured out a way of making something out of nothing and building up Dubai to what it is today. Wow, that's and, amazing. Yeah, it, it just, you know, using tourism, using, I mean, who would have thought that you could sell an apartment in what used to be a complete desert for 20 million dollars i mean <laughs> sure it, right that's amazing it, it really is amazing they have one of the t- you know they have huge commodity exchanges and you know other types of uh platforms that have been built there and you know 85 percent of the people living in dubai are expats and they were very smart offer you know low to no taxes and you get very smart people coming there and you know they figure out very creative ways that quietly tax those people and make lots of money in the, you know, in the meantime. Huh. So that's fascinating to me. See, I, I love, I love kind of just hearing how people do these things elsewhere. And and, and so I, I know when we kind of talked originally, um, there's a lot of kind of trying to figure out how to monetize things or can be really challenging for people. Or you know, a lot of apps are getting kind of cloned. You know, they're maybe not that successful in North America, or maybe they are, but they get cloned and moved into other parts of the world where they're potentially even bigger. How, have you yeah. seen quite quite a lot of that? Yeah, I think it goes both ways, definitely. I mean, the Samoa brothers out of Germany are probably the, the best and most well-known cloners out there. <laughs> okay. um, you know, they, they cloned Groupon originally, and they're billionaires. Okay. And they their company is called Rocket, and... Um, they you know, they've had a little bit more difficulty the last couple of years, but they've made a fortune over the last 15. And you know, they made a Groupon clone, launched it internationally. They've made, you know, they've modeled, they just take great U.S. ideas and take it into Africa, Europe, and, and other parts of the world. Really interesting. And, and really roll that out quickly. And you're seeing um, you know, people copying, let's say, Open Table or, or other types of platforms. I mean, even Uber. Um, you know, there were early Uber platforms uh, in, you know, Dubai being one. Um, but one company that, you know, the, probably the largest, you know, one of the largest technology investors in the world is based out of Cape Town. Really? And a company called, 
a company called Nospers. It's a seventy billion dollar company by market cap, and they made a little bet on a company in China in nineteen ninety nine. They put I think it's just a little bit under forty million on a little company called Tencent. Okay. And Tencent now is uh, you know right up there with Alibaba. Sure. They own we. Tencent owns WeChat. WeChat has. Uh, around 700 million users in China on their messaging platform. Wow. And so, but since then, um, you know, that value is, you know, that the market cap of Nosper is, uh, you know, as I said, 70 billion, and that's approximately the same value as their WeChat stake or their 10 cent stake. But they also own 17% of Flipkart, which is the largest e commerce site in India. They own a majority stake of souk.com in the Middle East, which is the largest e-commerce site in the Middle East. They just sold, uh, you know, one of the largest um, uh, auction sites, Allegro, that was in Poland for I think it was 2.4 billion last month. Wow. And you know they're taking big stakes, and they just uh, established a VC arm here in the United States. Uh, built up an office here within the last year in San Francisco. So it'd be really interesting to see. Uh, how they come into the U.S. and the impact that they have moving forward as they continue to diver- diversify. Sure. Do you find how do you find cultural differences like hinder or help or does it even really matter? Because it's got to matter at some some level, right? And I'm not saying like that in a negative way. It's just how you know people do things in North America or even state to state can be different than you know certain parts of the world. How how have you found that? Yeah, well, it's, it's always good to understand, you know, the customs and culture, and when you're going to different areas, I mean, that, especially in the Far East, uh, Middle East, you know, depending if it's more conservative or not, and yeah, I think you uh, have to respect those traditions, sure. and definitely, um, you know, be open to that, and it can be very frustrating too, and I'm sure for, you know, the parts of the Middle East for women entrepreneurs or other groups, it's, uh, you know, it, it's difficult. And, but just make sure, I think the key thing is, is to have a very good champion that uh, will help you succeed in those, those areas. Sure. And you know, the other thing is, is just really you know, networking and um, figuring out that landscape as quick as possible. I mean, who are the, the influencers, the players, and, you know, aligning yourself accordingly sure so when you say champion do you mean somebody in that country that you know that can kind of help you with things or, or what do you mean by that yeah yeah so a good example is uh, my first introduction when i um, went to dubai was we were working with the ministry of finance okay in the uae and we had a member of their team uh bring us into the country we were um working on an all-in-one card a competitor to, to coin okay um you know, at the time, and they were very interested in the technology of adopting that uh, for several different uses. And so the gentleman who brought us there was, he was awesome, uh, but introduced us into uh, a lot of other other areas, um, the Road and Transport Authority, you know, Dubai Holding, and other groups who are interested in technology and um, with other different potential use cases, as well as people like MasterCard and Visa locally. And figuring out who you know the the main people were, you know, working on that, you know, on the ground there, okay. as well as then other regional investors too, with you know investors or uh, influencers in Saudi and uh, other GCC countries, both coast countries in that area. No, yeah, that's that's fascinating to me. I, I love that kind of stuff, right? And there's how you guys you guys do that kind of stuff. But how do you open the doors? to these other countries or these companies when you're across the world, really, like you're divided by ocean, right? Well, it's, it's the world's becoming very flat. Sure. I mean, luckily for us, I mean, it's amazing how technology, uh, you know, be it, you know, Skype or whatever it is and you know, WhatsApp and, you know, all these technologies have basically made communication brought down to zero. Yeah. And, and it's just all a matter of dealing with time zones. And okay. just, you know, syncing the calendars and this and that, and um, you know, that's when you're dealing with other parts of the world. You, the 11 hour difference can be, you know, sometimes difficult and taxing, but it, you know, it, it is what it is. And um, but I, I think if you just 
spend your time and do your due diligence on what you're trying to achieve that you can definitely um, flatten that problem, uh, the geographic problem very quickly. Sure. So how often throughout the year would you say you're traveling to other countries? Is it half time, a quarter of the time? I would say probably around 20%. Okay. That's not too bad. No, no. It's, uh, you know, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks here this time and I do it uh, three to four times a year that I'll be making those trips. Okay. And then obviously you're just constantly in contact through Skype or email or the phone or other chat clients talking to different people across the world. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly how we operate and um, yeah, just to maximize everybody's time. And again, uh, what people are interested in is, you know, I need to be on the ground here too. So uh, right. a lot of my value comes from my presence sure. and yes, it's fun to travel and, you know, do that. But at the same time, um, you know, you need to remember why you're here, <laughs> um, you know, keep up relations, but you know, there's a lot of people to, to see here in the Valley. Sure. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I know you're big on kind of innovation and, and kind of talking about that. What do you kind of see as the kind of the next up and coming thing? Like, is it AI? Is it VR? Is that kind of ship kind of sailed already? What, what do you kind of see in the innovation space? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I think AR excites me more than VR. I okay. think VR, yeah, there's, there's definite use cases for VR, I think, uh, from medical and, and isolated instances. I, I just think from a social aspect, it's so isolating. Um, it's not like you're going to be on a VR headset on a subway. Yeah, <laughs> you just fair. Really, from a, you know, from a, you know, safety perspective. Um, and it's bad enough, I think, with phones and technology and how isolating the technology is, you know, become, but I think VR is going to be more difficult. So I do see the use cases more limited. AR, on the other hand, where you do are able to experience, uh, you know, the augmented reality aspects. I mean, HoloLens and seeing some of the early demos of what's coming out is really exciting. Sure. Um, it's, it's scary of what, you know, is, possible with these platforms and you know we're early days on that and we'll see how um you know i think that the you know we'll, we'll see how that matriculates and how that evolves but um yeah i think near term um yeah, i think conversational commerce is very exciting with uh also ai i mean i think everybody's talking about ai it's just really understanding good use cases for that you know for the technology and, you know, how do you speed up a process or automate a process um, and do it, do it well? So um, I've been working with companies. You know, one of the a passion projects I've been working on is an uh, anti-sexting platform. Oh, a, a, a friend of mine has a company called uh, Safe.ai. Okay. And uh, his name is Heath Ahrens. He was the founder of iSpeech. Uh, built that up to 60,000 developers developing off of it. Wow. And then he Meantime, he's built a very strong AI and image recognition platform, and there he's used that and tweaked it to, you know, um, detect you know, pornography and also bullying language and things like that. And sexting is one of the fastest growing problems among children. Sure. And I, you know, with this situation, technology has created a problem. You know, platforms like Snapchat are accelerating the problem, and is technologists it's our job to help alleviate and empower parents with the ability to once again take control of their children's digital lives so that's that's one area where i see ai and image recognition being you know very helpful and once again you know empowering people especially parents to uh you know benefit children sure and at least benefit a group so very direct i'm curious like i think it's great like playing in that space but like the biggest challenge has to be getting the users onto these platforms or have you guys found a way kind of around that where they can use whatever they want and then the OS monitors that or an app on the OS monitors what's happening in the, all these apps like is that even possible well that's a you know this is a difficult place so we're going to the the device manufacturers now and, and talking oh, okay. about this but, I got you you, know, you have to go into the OS and sure. we you know we video out on Facebook 
we've done a lot of A-B testing quietly in the background of, of you know, different aspects of the platform. Um, we put a just a kind of a PSA video, okay. personal service announcement, and we seeded it with a very small amount of money, $700. And um, we were able to get uh, around 5 million views with that. Wow, that's quickly. awesome. Yeah, so it just showed us that there was really a need and there was uh, over you know, 75,000 shares. It showed us that people were interested and it was a topic that resonated well with parents. Sure. And that was going down the right path. And But yes, this is a, one where we're going to be working with the device manufacturers because it does have to integrate in the OS. If you were to release this as an app, you'd just be playing whack-a-mole. Yeah. You know? Or an SDK, so that's the tough part about it. And again, that is, you know, it's getting people to buy into the vision. And um, I think quickly, anybody who has a who has a child understands that there's a problem. Yeah. And so, but you know, that's that's an extreme case though, because there's a lot of other AI where the use case isn't so apparent, but there is definitely a great benefit. Um, yes, and how do you get people on board with that and it is working you know that's where partnerships um and you know just trying to figure out how do you accelerate that distribution and leveraging platforms like facebook or uh you know other social media channels to get that word out sure and oh, oh go ahead sorry it's really a case-by-case -case basis i think when you when you approach that depending on what your target who your tar target audience is and um you know what what that demographic looks like so sure. you can't really pigeon, pigeonhole it no that makes sense and really like really depends on kind of the the screen size you're trying to target too right because sometimes what works on mobile doesn't necessarily work on the web or what works inside of an app doesn't necessarily work anywhere else and like it seems to me anyway and i think you and i were kind of talking about this when we when we talked weeks ago that like you know, Facebook obviously is monetized like crazy um, and they figured it out and they, you know, kind of even figured out how to monetize their mobile app. But um, their chat app, for example, they haven't really figured out how to monetize their chat app where, you know, when they split them apart from each other and if they're struggling to monetize that, it's kind of like, well, was that the right call or are they going to move back together or are they going to figure out how to monetize or kind of like what's your, not maybe not necessarily just about Facebook, but what's your take on kind of how to monetize on the different kind of platforms and different screen sizes? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's it's a good question. I think it's a case by case basis. But you know, as far as is on the monetization goes for Facebook, um, you know, when it comes to the app, you know, really with the, the messaging apps, everybody is trying to copy the WeChat platform, and WeChat was started in China again by Tencent. And they are averaging almost seven dollars of annual revenue per user on WeChat. And you know, with Facebook, their global ARPU is you know, annual annual revenue per user is around four dollars. Wow! So it just shows you how you know strong WeChat has been, and where a lot of that revenue is coming from is from gaming. And you, almost 50% of the revenue is coming from gaming. And what you just saw Facebook do uh, last week or two weeks ago was launch a new gaming platform on, you know, on Messenger. I'm sure. So we're, we're in the early days of monetization. And I think, you know, Facebook hired David Marcus, who is an amazing guy. I mean, he was former head of PayPal. And when you're coming from PayPal, you probably know a few things about payments. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, so when it comes to that side, you know, I think the question that, that Facebook is always faced with is you, you have to be somewhat neutral, take somewhat of a Switzerland approach to, you know, broaden your potential monetization audience. And you work with, you know, other advertisers and, and people like that. And you just can't upset too many people. Um, but how do you do that and still, you know, make the most money for yourself? Sure. And they're just going very, you know, uh, they're, they're taking a very slow approach to it. And but they will be doing very, very big things very, you know, in the next 
24 to 36 months. Sure. And you look at Facebook Connect and the ubiquity that, that you know, from an ID identification standard across the web and what that provides for you, think about how easily they can apply something like that with payments. Mm-hmm. And we all can realize very quickly um, how that will change the game. And, you know, again, identity is another part that they own. They know so much about you as it is that with payments and, you know, the fraud, anti-fraud aspects of what they'll be able to have will be immense. Yeah. And, and, you know, that is only getting going to get stronger as they develop deeper AI and machine learning with all these little pieces that they're collecting about you. Sure. And so give it time. Um, you know, they, they talk about the Facebook feed is uh, almost hitting a saturation point. There's plenty of other areas of monetization for them. Sure. Moving. The, the other thing I'm curious about to get your take on is obviously like the Amazon Echo has been out for a while. Google just launched Google Home. You know, Apple has Siri. Um, that they just recently put into their new version, their OS, and, and you know, like Android and um, the iPhone have had Siri and Android's ch- chat service, whatever, Google Now. Um, how do you think that they're going to monetize these services long term when you just, you're literally talking at things, right? And you're, in, in a lot of cases, you're not even looking at anything. Well, you know, it's a great question. And, you know, it's interesting that we are slowly moving. And I think AR is going to help facilitate this moving away from the traditional screen. Sure. And, you know, we've gone from, you know, the monitor to a phone to, you know, something that will probably be less if non existent. And it's going through that, the screenless UI, uh, be it in a car and, and, other areas and it's hard to get used to that and thinking about that change totally but that is where you know i briefly mentioned before about conversational commerce um and conversational commerce will be a huge driver moving forward and it's just having that ability where you don't have to necessarily type in all the inputs but having your phone and having that platform that you're talking into be it uh, Google or Amazon, where it's location aware. They know where you you are. If let's say I want to buy a plane ticket, they know that I'm in San Francisco and I want to fly tomorrow to LA on United and use my frequent flyer number, that those items are stored, that they could figure out, you know, what you want to buy on time or this or that. Through a quick series of questions, you can just purchase that ticket. Sure. And you really need a screen for that. And so, you know, we're in the early days. And I think what you're seeing with Echo and these other platforms is they're testing that out. And they're really learning um, the best ways to perfect that, um, that, that user experience. I mean, this is a really new world of UX that we're not used to. And it takes a while for people to adapt to these types of platforms. Sure. Because like part of me is wondering if you just ask like the Echo or Google Home, something as simple as like, I need a plumber now, you know, like from the AdSense side of that, if it's even called AdSense, is do you get the first recommended plumber that pays the most per per like voice click for lack of a better term, you know, and they send you a plumber or whatever and Google gets, I don't know, a dollar or whatever for sending them that lead or maybe it's five dollars or maybe it's ten dollars who knows right but like well, that, that's stuff i've it, been thinking about anyway it's a huge problem and i think you know you could say find me the cheapest you know plumber or find me the the most highly rated yeah or one that um you know there's different uh conditions sure. that you could put on that. and you know it's something you have to think about because once you do remove that interface you don't have that the your selection becomes very limited. Yeah. And as we know, on the other end, they're going to do what maximizes their uh, profitability. Totally. And, you know, uh, ads in the future will be based very, you know, well, they're doing it now, targeted by zip code or whatever it may be. And, and to give you that top level priority, you know, uh, people will pay more. So, 
Yes, that's a problem. And, but, you know, Amazon's doing that today. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize that Amazon, it's not always the cheapest that they're giving you the first. If you dig in, you'll realize there's other providers. Sure. And and it's, it's to that benefit. So that, that happens today, and you just have to be, you know, more cognizant of it, I guess. Yeah, that's fair. And, like, I know, like, Spotify, for example, if you don't pay for their monthly service, they'll give you, like, if you watch this, like, few minute video you get like 30 minutes of no ads right so it's there's a way there's ways to do that stuff or like you said pandora for example gives you rate like ads based on your location which makes sense so i i, I they'll figure out how to do it right well absolutely and i think with the content aware advertising it's, it's definitely there already and i think it just the more with machine learning and putting multiple variables together uh, the targeting will just get better. And there's so much that you can learn from users today from, you know, their phones, their habits. It, it's scary. It really is. I mean, I've been dealing with AI companies who can basically tell within around an 80% degree of accuracy of how much you make really? just by looking at the images on your phone. And those images never leave the phone. And oh. you just using AI and uh, looking at the underlying brands that you wear, looking at um, you know, just your lifestyle that's uh, based on your photo roll. And you, know, you don't realize it, but many times you are clicking to give them the right to look at those photos and companies will take full advantage of that. Sure, I guess that makes a lot. Yeah, that makes sense because the more convenience you're willing to give up, the more you're kind of giving away to Absolutely. somebody to provide that convenience to you. No, that's been the Google model all along. Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And you want free storage, of course, but they're going to look at all your pictures and everything else to you know learn more about you. Sure. And it, everything comes at a price. And but you, you, know, you think about it, they can tell, okay, here's the zip code where you live, where you spend a preponderance of your time. They can tell if you travel, you know, if you're recently engaged or not, or married just by you know wedding rings and pictures, uh, children, um, you know, wives, husbands, mistresses, you know, they can tell a lot of different things. Sure. And, um, and they'll target ads accordingly. And you're going to see that happen more and more moving forward. Sure. No, that's, that's fascinating. Well, Alan, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So maybe let's close the show with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and uh, Series A online. I appreciate that, Kevin. Yeah, you can go to it's www dot series s e r i e s hyphen a dot com and you can find my whole background there and uh also feel free to reach out to me on linkedin perfect and uh, i'll definitely, definitely respond back perfect man well i really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show and i look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a safe trip to south africa thank you very much have a great holiday all right you I too. appreciate it okay. bye okay bye Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.